On July 1, 1940, the dictator of Spain, Francisco Franco, met with the Portuguese ambassador. Those were dark times, World War II was ravaging Europe, and Nazi troops seemed unbeatable, conquering everything in their path and annihilating their enemies. A week before the meeting between the Spanish leader and the Portuguese diplomat, France had surrendered to the might of the German army, lasting only six weeks before raising the white flag. During the meeting, Franco tried to convince the ambassador that Portugal should abandon its traditional alliance with Great Britain. The Generalissimo, a pragmatic ruler, said the following, Hitler is an extraordinary man, moderate, sensitive, full of humanity, and with great ideas. Germany has already won the war. The most that England can do is to hold out a bit longer, hoping for better peace terms than France. What the dictator was implying, and he was correct, was that Portugal's situation was extremely complex. Its geographical location made it bordered by Nazi Germany and fascist Spain to the east, and by Allied-occupied Britain to the north. The major players in the war were eager to gain control of Portugal and its natural resources. In such a delicate context, the Portuguese would have to move cautiously if they didn't want to be invaded and lose their independence. However, they would do more than that, directly influencing the outcome of the conflict and the lives of thousands of people. Today, in this new episode of Military History, we will tell you all about Portugal's role during World War II. To understand this history, we have to go back to the decade before the outbreak of the war. In 1926, a group of military leaders led a coup against the Portuguese government. This marked the end of the republic and the beginning of a dictatorship, which initially also failed to address the nation's serious economic problems. The situation could only be rectified thanks to the intervention of Antonio de Oliveira Salazar, an economist who took over the Ministry of Finance and quickly stabilized the country. By 1932, the minister had become the strongman of the government, valued both by the Portuguese civilian population and the armed forces, who saw him as a savior. With the support he enjoyed, Salazar assumed the position of prime minister and enacted a new constitution with strong authoritarian characteristics, granting him dictatorial powers. The leader established the Estado Novo, as his single-party regime was called, which was anti-communist and Catholic in nature. Censorship was commonplace, and newspapers, radio, and later television were monitored for criticisms of the government or the church. The cult of the leader was encouraged, and through official propaganda, Salazar was portrayed as a austere, moderate man wholly committed to the well-being of his people. Meanwhile, the streets were patrolled by the dreaded PIDE, the International and State Defense Police, whose task was to suppress opposition and sow terror among the population. Those who dared to defy Salazar could be detained, interrogated, and mercilessly tortured. Meanwhile, in Germany, Hitler had come to power, and Nazism was growing stronger. The Führer's speeches made it clear that he intended to expand into Europe, and it seemed that war was on the horizon. In this context, the Portuguese leader maneuvered to reaffirm his country's neutrality. He did not want the Lusitanian nation to become involved in a conflict he felt was not their own, in which they had more to lose than to gain. On the other hand, he feared that dictator Francisco Franco might lean towards the Axis, given his sympathies for Nazism. If this happened, it was possible that Spain's next step would be to invade and annex Portugal. Therefore, in March 1939, just a few months before the start of the war, Salazar convinced the Spanish government to sign a non-aggression treaty that would keep the Iberian Peninsula neutral. The Nazis had their eyes on Portugal for several reasons. The first was its geographical location, as it could control the Bay of Biscay and the Strait of Gibraltar. If they gained control of these waters, Hitler could expedite his plans to conquer England. At the same time, Portugal was a colonial empire with various overseas territories of strategic value in Africa, Asia, and the Atlantic Ocean. 
Lastly, Hitler knew that Portugal had significant reserves of tungsten, a mineral essential for the military industry, as it was used to make ammunition. At the start of World War II, Salazar's country had become a coveted treasure for all. Not only did the Germans desire it, but also the Allies, particularly the British, who pressured the Portuguese government to maintain preferential treatment toward them. The Portuguese had to employ the art of diplomacy to please both sides and not appear too favorable to either. It was a delicate and dangerous game, in which a mistake could cost them their political independence. To appease the Axis, Salazar bought arms from the Germans and Italians. This displeased the British, who requested that Portugal halt the trade and purchase military equipment from them. Portugal accepted and ordered a batch of Gloucester Gladiator biplanes and Spitfire fighter bombers. The precarious balance Salazar had achieved was nearly disrupted in the summer of 1940. As we mentioned at the beginning of this video, by that time, France had surrendered to Germany. Francisco Franco met with the Portuguese ambassador to suggest that his government abandon its alliance with England, as Hitler was too powerful. In fact, the German high command had devised Operation Felix, a military maneuver aimed at seizing the Strait of Gibraltar. To do this, it would be necessary to send the Wehrmacht through Spain and occupy Portugal, which had only a small army of 55,000 men to defend itself. According to the most pessimistic estimates, the invasion would be completed in no more than three weeks. The German plan stipulated that, once the operation was complete, German troops would withdraw, and Portugal would become part of Spain. Obviously, Franco was aware of Operation Felix and had given it his approval, hoping to get a piece of the annexation. Fortunately for the Portuguese, the maneuver never materialized. The reason was simple, in 1941, the Third Reich concentrated all its energies on the invasion of the Soviet Union, so it had neither men nor tanks to waste in the Iberian Peninsula. This allowed Salazar to continue his game of strict neutrality and, to demonstrate that he was not favoring either side, he decided to sell tungsten in equal quantities to both warring parties. Thus, neither the Axis nor the Allies could accuse Portugal of favoring their enemy. It was a clever strategy because Portugal filled its coffers with gold through the trade of this mineral. It is estimated that they earned 400 tons of gold, which today would be equivalent to $20 billion. The Nazis, however, did not pay with their own money but used funds stolen from the central banks of the Netherlands, Belgium, and France. At the same time, Portugal became a haven for those persecuted by Hitler. Salazar allowed the entry of refugees as long as they left the country quickly. In this way, many people traveled through Europe with the hope of reaching Portugal and then embarking for America, away from the horrors of war. The Portuguese government was not anti-Semitic, although during the war, it tightened its immigration policy to appease the Axis. Nevertheless, desperate men and women continued to arrive, fleeing the clutches of Nazism. Many of them entered Portugal clandestinely, using forged documents. Experts believe that hundreds of thousands of people were saved thanks to Salazar's relatively open border policy, although the exact number remains a subject of debate. In August 1943, the Portuguese government made a final and risky move. It signed an agreement with the British, allowing them to use Portuguese military bases in the Azores Islands, located in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. Let's watch a British news report from the time showing the Royal Air Force setting up camp on the islands. Wireless and necessary telephone communications were quickly established. In fact, the whole organization was in working order in less than two days. And although the Air Force flag is flying, it is not in any sense an occupation. All our men will be withdrawn at the end of the war. Our presence here is an act of courtesy by the Portuguese government. This marked a turning point in the Battle of the Atlantic, the naval struggle between Germany and the Allies. From this point on, Hitler's enemies had a new place to refuel and send their ships and planes. From there, British forces could provide air cover for their convoys, and Portuguese aircraft even collaborated by conducting reconnaissance missions and weather flights. 
This helped the United States and Great Britain confront and defeat the powerful German fleet. Thus, Portugal's neutrality tilted toward the Allies, providing them with crucial support when they needed it most. Nevertheless, in 1945, when the news of Hitler's suicide in Germany's surrender became known, none of this prevented Salazar from sending a telegram of condolence for the death of the German dictator. The Portuguese leader was, above all, a man of good manners. In conclusion, Portugal played a more significant role than people recognized during the course of World War II. It allowed the salvation of thousands of people and, on the other hand, contributed to the defeat of the Axis by allowing the Allies to use the Azores Islands. The Lusitanian nation benefited greatly from the tungsten trade and, in the post-war period, was recognized by the victors for contributing to the war effort despite being neutral. Salazar's dictatorship had a bright future and, in fact, it remained in power until 1974, making it the longest-lasting authoritarian government in Europe. We've reached the end of the video, leave your comments below, and don't forget to subscribe to our channel to learn about many more military events that left their mark on history.